close to a person who was known as a Balas Chesed in Geula. And she taught me something which I never forgot. She lived in this very, very simple place. And Gula, if you can see from the picture, it's, it's, it's not very rich. And she did not have a lot. In fact, she told me that she didn't have a washing machine. And what she loved about not having a washing machine was that she wouldn't have to wait for the machine to finish washing. She could, when she did it by hand, she could do it in her time and she could control how long it took to do it. And I always had a washing machine. So that was, that was really surprising. But what she did teach me was in her very clean, but very simple home, she had about, must have been 30 tzedakah boxes, 30 pushkas on, the, on her mantle. And she said every day she puts some money in each one of those, even just a few prutot, a few coins in each one. And her intention is to connect with all these different people in all these different places spiritually by giving the tzedakah to those people. And she taught me that it was possible to be physically in one place, but to be spiritually connected with all of the Jewish community. And that is something which I was only 22 at the time. And that is something which I have taken um, that she showed us that where we are physically isn't always where we have to be in our consciousness. So let's keep that lesson in mind and go to the next slide if I can figure out how to do it. Okay, so our lives are dramatically changed now. It is not possible to say anything else. And old routines, it's hard to keep up. In fact, I was, I was setting up my calendar for the month of April and I had to delete several things in there. So how do we keep things normal? What happens when we try to keep up our old habits and routine, routines? I have a friend on um, Twitter who is writing in there how exhausted she is because she's working around the clock to create uh, materials for online teaching. And she is an expert. She's written, a, written and published a couple of books. And her last tweet was that um, she's now a YouTuber because YouTube offered to pay her a few cents for her YouTube videos. So she's working too hard, but she's very, very productive. Um, um, many of my colleagues who are teachers are expected to teach online and using the same face-to-face -face methods that don't keep learners engaged even when they're in the classroom. Um, stores are out of essentials like toilet paper and eggs. Those are just some examples of old routines, old expectations from even four or five weeks ago. Things are dramatically changed. We're also faced with extended unknowns. We don't know how long this is going to happen. We don't know what the economy is going to look like, um, who will survive this and who won't. It kind of feels like Yom Kippur in a way. Um, so let's go into how our brains process. Here's a picture of my mom and her baby brother. Um, and I want to talk about this. When you look at that picture, something happens in your brain that it immediately grasps for most of us. Now there are those who are, whose brains are not neurotypical, but most of us will look at that and, and, and we'll have an idea of what they're feeling and what's going on there. The, the effect. I can't see the picture. You can't see the picture? No. Okay, so yeah, that's right. Those of you who are on, okay. Um, I have, uh, let me describe it. Sorry, I forgot about that. Um, you have a, my mother is in her early 70s here. Her brother, probably late 60s. And uh, they're sitting on the couch together. His arm is tightly wrapped around her shoulder and her hand is on his knee. And they are smiling so that they're, they're smiling so widely that, that, that their faces are shining. And, and looking at a picture like this, when you see it, your mind immediately, when you look at it, knows what, what is going on and, and your intuition kicks in. And it only takes a few seconds. I had to describe it in words because not everybody sees it. So this corresponds to two brain speeds. We have two brain speeds that happen all the time, fast thinking and slow thinking. 
So that was fast, fast thinking. If you could see it, it would have been fast thinking because your intuition and your own immediate jumping to conclusions would come in. Now, slow thinking is, for most of us, if I would ask you to solve this math problem, 91 times 62. Most of us would have to stop and think about how to solve the problem. We might have an idea of how big or small the answer is to estimate, but the exact answer will require some active thinking. So in order for our brains to handle everything that we encounter in life and to avoid overload, our brains rely on this fast thinking, which relies on habit and intuition. So those are shortcuts. So for example, those of us who read, profu pro read proficiently and, and read well, many of the words we don't have to, we don't have to stop. We can just like our brain immediately sees that word and keeps going and, and maybe we have to slow down for difficult words. Driving, lots of us can drive on, on automatic pilot if we're driving that same carpool for, God help us, 20 years or whatever, or 10 years. Um, and routines like getting up in the morning and brushing our teeth or at night taking a shower or making Shabbos or making Pesach. My husband and I are making Pesach. We have a routine. I know where to put the tablecloth. I know how to do the refrigerator, right? You know, all those things. And it didn't take a lot of thinking. Once I got started, it was intuitive muscle memory. But when we have our routines disrupted, for example, we don't we can't daven in shul. We can't go to a shir. We can't exercise at the gym. Um, we can't do those sit in our desk and and do our schoolwork, our that worksheet that they expect us to do. And you know, if we're trying to do that same worksheet at home, um, mom is in the kitchen and our brothers and sisters are running around and they're they're online working on their stuff. And and oh my gosh, this is too boring. I can't do this. Um, Lots of kids are struggling with that. Um, meetings and appointments have to be delayed. Uh, we can't go out and do errands in the neighborhood. So that creates a sort of cognitive shift, which can, which can be overloading. So what's at stake? What's at stake is that this could lead to some kind of trauma. And I wanted to define what trauma is. It has many definitions. Um, let me try to pronounce this. Satvitni tells us that trauma is unique individual experience. It can be one event, like a terrorist attack, God forbid, or it can be ongoing events like a war or living in a dangerous neighborhood. In fact, when I taught in the inner city, I had some kids who came in and said that there was a shooting on their block and there were several children in the classroom. They were, you know, 14 years old or 13 years old, and they couldn't learn because they were still processing that there had been a shooting on their block. Family violence, whether it's child abuse or neglect or witnessing violence, it's all very traumatic. But no matter how big the event or small the event, what makes it traumatic is the inability to stay present, to understand what's happening and to integrate the experience and to understand that it's over. It causes the individual to feel that there is a threat to life, bodily integrity, or sanity. How does this relate to our situation right now? It would be more traumatic for somebody who just lost a grandparent, God forbid, or someone in their family that they were close to, or a close friend, God forbid. That definitely meets the criteria for traumatic. It would be more traumatic if somebody is fighting domestic violence, which there has been a huge rise in domestic violence. Um, it would be more difficult for someone who, before this happened, has difficulty with anxiety um, or moods, uh, or someone who has an eating disorder. Those are people who are at risk. Or somebody who is inflexible, or somebody who has has disciplines that they do every day and they can't do those things. Somebody who's sitting, who's, who's in the one year of, um, of mourning and saying cottage, they can't go to say cottage. That could feel very, very difficult, very painful. 
let's go to the next page. The effects on children. Children are dependent on us, their caregivers. And research indicates that children can be traumatic, traumatized in a variety of ways, including a frightened and frightening caregivers. So if the parent themselves is very frightened and checking the news all the time, the kids, whether or not anything is said or not, the, the kids can pick up on a parent's fear. If there's some kind of separation or abandonment, um, maybe everybody expected the grandparents to come, um, the aunts and uncles to come, and, and there's no connection and there's a feeling of abandonment. Um, if there's, God forbid, domestic violence that kids are exposed to, if the parents are fighting a lot, um, if there are threatening words or behaviors, these uh, secondary effects of parental PTSD um, was researched by Yehuda, um, children of Holocaust survivors. If there are accidents, medical crises, um, surgery, um, or if a parent or a parent figure is pa passes away. Um, what are some of the symptoms? Okay, so how do you know that you might be experiencing trauma? Um, depression, irritability, a sense of numbing, difficulty sleeping, difficulty concentrating. Hypervigilance means that you're just constantly checking the news, checking the news, checking to see who's out, who's not out. Mistrust, a sense of shame, self-blame, hopelessness, nightmares, flashbacks from previous traumas, chronic pain. You might be getting chronic headaches or backaches. I know I was getting backaches. Um, and uh, some of that's just from sitting in the desk all the time. Um, eating disorders, uh, suddenly people are, where they were able to keep their diet before, they might find themselves going for that extra portion um, if they have access to foods which, which are not healthy for them. Uh, there might be increases in substance abuse. Ah, and God forbid there might be people who have thoughts of harming themselves. And how do these symptoms help you to survive? I want to take away a stigma or just present the idea of how to take away the stigma. All of those symptoms, all of those problems that people have in the face of trauma are evidence of adaptation. Why do trauma survivors have symptoms instead of memories? That's what your mind does. The way the brain is organized, trauma is held in other parts of the brain. Memory is stored in several areas of the brain. Conscious memory requires the parts to connect to each other. That's where we come to this idea of journaling. How might we process our experiences consciously? So. Let's say you have somebody who's experiencing a lot of anxiety these days and they're checking the news all the time, all the time, and they have heightened anxiety, heightened irritability. They're having difficulty concentrating. They can't get their cleaning done for PESA. We can't stop our stress response. Stress literally is basically respond to, response to a lot of change. If there's too much change too quickly, we get stressed and that's how we survive. We can notice what's going on and respond with compassion and care. That's, that's where journaling comes in. So this is, this is I have in front of me, I have a, a chart that comes from Janina Fisher, um, how the nervous system helps us defend ourselves. Um, and I just wanna make sure that I don't take too much time on this, but, but many of you have probably heard about the fight or flight response. Um, let's say, Classically, we talk about a, a tiger that's coming at you. So let's say there's a tiger running toward you. What does your body do? Your body needs to do something. So there's a neurochemical release, a chemical released in the brain, which triggers the parasympathetic system. And it makes you, it makes you have the energy you're to, to run. And you're either going to run or defend yourself. And um, when the brain, the body uses a adrenaline rush to increase your heart rate and respiration, causing muscles to tense and a surge of energy that prepares us for action. And the frontal lobes shut down. In other words, 
the frontal lobes are needed for us to think. And when they shut down, we have increased speed of response. So we could move many, we could move very quickly when faced with that tiger, but we can't necessarily think clearly. And then there's a neurochemical response release, which triggers the, uh, the first one is the sympathetic nervous system. That's the, the fight, the fight or the, the, the running. The parasympathetic nervous system is freeze. Don't move, it's not safe. That, that deer in the headlights. And the parasympathetic nervous system, when it isn't safe to flee or fight, or when it's over, other chemicals slow your heart rate and your breathing, leading to physical collapse and exhaustion. Gastrointestinal, increased gut activity, and, um, and you might freeze and submit. So if you see, if anybody ever saw a, um, a, uh, an animal who was faced like a squirrel, who's faced with, uh, with a human being coming up to them, instead of running, they might, they might just freeze in place. Um, so the easiest way to access our stress response, our stress response, since when we're under stress, our frontal lobes aren't working that clearly, but, but our body is sending us signals. So notice what your body is telling you. That is the easiest way. You may or may not be aware of your emotions. Are you tired? Are you irritable? Are you having difficulty digesting food? Well, I see I misspelled difficulty. Uh, do you have aches and pains? And, or are you spaced out? That would correspond to what we were talking about before, that fight or flight or freeze. And different people respond in different ways. Okay, so why do we do a journal? I'm talking about doing journaling because that brings to conscious mind to keep a record of, of what we're feeling and what we're doing. My first step would be to suggest to keep a to-do list in a calendar. The to-do list can be on post-its, paper or electronic or both. I keep both. I have post-its, I have, I have clipboards, I have colored pens, I have highlighters. I, you know, I've been doing this for a while. Um, calendars can be, you can use a Google calendar, you can use, uh, you need a calendar which has some room in it. Um, a Google month or pay-per-view uh, for a month overview. And when you plot out your month, start with that, plotting out your month, notice what you're feeling and thinking. And when I was doing that this evening, I, I noticed that I had to delete a lot of events, which left me a lot of open spaces that it's up to me to fill in through my own discipline or my own drive or my own self-care. And it's going to take me some time to figure out a routine for that. Your list can be mixed up or sorted by type of task. If you use post-its, you can sort it afterwards, your, your to-do list. Um, you can throw out the post-its after the task is done. You can color code tasks with highlighters or colored gel pens. Do it as an experiment and, experiment and make it playful. So here's what I want you to have in mind. You may not do anything on that list. You may not accomplish anything on that list. The list is there for you just to be aware that there's a part of you that expects you to do it. Or maybe somebody on the outside expects you to do it. If you have an employer and your employer expects you to do A to Z list of things, and if you're a homemaker and you're making pay stuff, you have A to Z things to do. If, if you're a kid and you have classwork and homework, you have a lot of things on that list. You may not be doing anything or you may be doing some of those things. This is not about getting you to do things that you don't or you can't do. This is about being aware of what's actually happening. I actually, um, I also found old pictures of myself in my um, digital pictures and I made myself like a, copies of these little tiny pictures and I cut them out and I glue them in my planner. So we'll get to that. So start to notice what gets done, what do you avoid? 
What do you have to force yourself to do? And what do you, what do, you do quickly? Okay? Some of us are sitting and saying, tell them a lot. That's amazing. I mean, I, I'm in a tell them group, I, and I see that there's a friend of mine who's on tell them 24 hours a day. I can't do that. It's, I, I have the amount that I do. I have it as a habit, and I continue to think about it. Usually, I miss it today, but I usually get to that. Um, I color code. So I use red or pink for tasks that I avoid or put off. But I don't always know if I'm gonna avoid it, so I might color code it. I usually color code it at the end of the day. Green for tests that I use for a learning experience, and it's just the colors I use. You can use any, any colors or any method that you want. In other words, this is an experiment. There's no failure here. Blue for tasks that are fun, that's just what I use. Yellow or orange, I sometimes use for things that I have to push off, but um, that I'm procrastinating, but I do them anyway. I would love to hear from some of the kids. This one I made for a student. This was a writing activity. Um, and let me describe what I have here. This is a journal writing activity, which is a mindfulness practice. The first step is to take two minutes to notice your breath. Then answer these questions. So two minutes might be a long time and you may need a timer or you may just want to do 30 seconds. Excuse me, I'm just going to take a drink. You can start with any of these things. <coughs> I usually start with how my body is feeling. How is my body feeling? Start with my head, work my way down to my feet. And you might write, write it down somewhere. What are my thoughts? You can write that down. What am I feeling? And I suggest some ideas of what you might be feeling. Excited, hyper, happy, calm, focused, peaceful, thankful, restless, awkward, worried, curious, tired, sad, etc. And what setting am I in now? And this could be written in a journal. Um, to start a writing task, uh, you can write four sentences, three sentences with one drawing, two sentences with two drawings, one sentence with three drawings. I give those options for the journaling. Um, this is the idea, this is a writing practice also um, to give kids a chance to practice sentence writing and spelling and all that good stuff. Um, parents can do this too. And then we have another suggestion, another idea for journaling. So we have one part, which is the calendaring, which I think I just made up that word. And you do a month at a time, then you do a week at a time, and then you do a day at a time. And then along with that, noticing what is getting done and what is not getting done. So at that point, what you might do is color code what got done, what didn't get done on your calendar. And, and then have a journal where you're keeping track of what your sensations are and what your thoughts are. Where are you when that's happening um, and what your feelings are. If you're experiencing the freeze, the free, freeze mode of uh, flight or fight, flight, fight or freeze, you may not have any feelings at all. You may need to start with your body. Um, and here's another graphic organizer for a check-in. Um, and have a check-in maybe set to do this twice a week. And, um, or you might wanna do it once a week. You might wanna do it every other day. It doesn't really matter. This is just for you to experiment. And this has four steps. What is on my to-do list? What tasks are completed? Two, how do I celebrate completed work? So you don't want to just be thinking about the stuff that you have to force yourself to do. Every single thing on that list is anything that you get done. Even if it means just brushing your teeth or, you know, or eating breakfast. In this day and age, just being aware of what you did do. Three, what feelings am I having? What sensations am I having? By sensations, I mean, what is your body telling you? And what am I thinking? And are any 
parts of me, are there any parts of me that are critical of me or others? Here's where we're getting into this, a whole other idea that I'm suggesting that you might experiment with this. You may or may not want to do this, or you may want to do this. Um, I think it's pretty common knowledge for people to say, well, a part of me wanted to do this and a part of me didn't want to do this. Or, a part of me really enjoyed that event, but there was part of me that was like really spaced out. That's kind of a general way that, that we talk about when we have mixed feelings about things. So let me explain what we call going inside. Going inside is a term that comes from a model called the internal family systems model. Richard Schwartz, began his career he started this he, he invented this approach to to psychotherapy and he began his career as a systemic family therapist and he developed this model in response to clients descriptions of various parts within themselves now let me explain that i'm not talking about somebody who's schizophrenic who has actually hearing voices okay we're not talking about people who are psychotic we're talking about people who who have normal everyday mental health challenges, or maybe in the moderate challenges. So Schwartz, one of the things I started reading his book a few days ago, he took from a variety of existing theories, including family systems, family therapy. And, um, and he said, we have inside ourselves an internal family of different personas, different parts. So you have your family, which is on the outside, which is your mom, your dad, your husband, your brothers, your sisters, your cousins, you know, all these people. But then you have different parts of you, which are inside. And that's not yourself. Yourself, he has something which he calls the self. And Although he might be Jewish, I don't know if he is or he isn't. I, I don't know how you would compare it to the nefesh or the neshama. It is something which is a higher self, something which is a leader, which is, which is an essential part of that person. So we might see it as the neshama or the, or the, the soul of the person. And then we have the parts. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to explain was that... Um, he also took from Gestalt therapy um, from Fritz Perls, who had an activity that he used to do called the empty chair, where either it was from a dream or if it was from something that somebody, a client was going through, he would say, well, make believe that that part of you is in the empty chair and talk to that part. Or when we dream, he would say um, every single symbol or piece of the dream is a part of you. So take that, that ocean that you dreamed about, put that ocean in your empty chair. What is that ocean telling you? So Dr. Schwartz took that and the systems model and he said, well, we have these internal parts and when we have trauma, these parts become blended with the self. It gets confused and we, and they're kind of mixed up. And um, there are Three main parts. The self is not a part. The self is, is it transcends and it's above that. But the parts are managers, firefighters, and exiles. When someone is getting therapy through the internal family systems model, it's very important to recognize that all parts are welcome and parts are protectors. Managers might be a part of you that is constantly scolding you. It might be a part of you that, um, um, that won't let you have fun. It might be a part of you that, um, that is tired all the time. Um, firefighters are the part that, um, the fight or flight, that, that's the part that sets in when things are escalated, when a person really feels very, very overwhelmed and can't think straight. 
And firefighters are usually connected to things like overeating or substance abuse or, um, uh, or not even just substance abuse or, or just turning to, to things like, you know, watching TV all the time or, you know, things that block our awareness and our consciousness. Um, Exiles are the parts of us which our manager and our firefighter kind of tucks away and doesn't let us talk to and doesn't let us doesn't let that part out for expression. But all of these are protectors. What we're talking about is the firefighters and the exiles, they might reside in the part of the brain where the emotions and the fight or flight system takes place. So they are part of your implicit memory. In other words, you can't, you can't use your thinking mind, your, your thoughts to, to get in touch with those parts of you. But you can use yourself and the signals that your body tells you to start to unblend these parts. So going back over here, when I said, what part is with me now? Ah, so I have an example here of, I created this graphic organizer. Hold on. I created a graphic organizer, which I will describe. Here it is. What does it mean to communicate with parts? So, so I made this kind of easier where it has, it, it has one, two, three, four, five boxes and five questions. Where am I? What am I feeling? What am I doing? What is my body doing? And what part is with me now? So to explain how this works, I bring an example of, an, of I, I invented this graphic organizer last week and I've been playing with it. So I had an experience on Sunday, I guess, in the morning, um, where was I? I was here in my office, and I was feeling joy and gratitude. That, for me, in this time is kind of amazing. Um, I have Zoom meeting sessions with my father, who lives in Israel, and um, I do this, now I'm doing it four times a week for most, usually, hour sessions. I play my flute with him, and I'm reading to him. Now, my breath is usually tight and I have difficulty playing the flute because that part of me is still in exile. Um, and I found a picture of myself in a swing and I cut that out and I put it in my journal to stand for the exiled part of me. But I found that my body was, I was able to sing and I was able to play. My body was feeling free. And it felt like that little girl in the swing was coming out. I, and that's why I was feeling joy and gratitude. So on one side, I, I filled out this graphic organizer. On the other side, what I did was the door in the swing was, was a part of me, which usually is an exile. And, and then I wrote, in different color pen, I had the self talking to the Deborah in the swing, and I said, "Thank you, everyone, for letting Deborah out to play." So that was a positive experience that I was, I was having gratitude that that I had a moment there where my breath was flowing and and the music was flowing, and and I was able to enjoy being with my father. Now, what might happen? You might find yourself making the same mistake over and over and over. Um, I consulted with a colleague and he said, he didn't think that experimenting with the, the parts would be risky because your defenses are there and your defenses will stay there unless they feel safe enough to, to, to step back. So you might find that you make the same mistake over and over and over and over. Um, for example, a critical part might keep criticizing and tearing you down. And you might try to talk to him or her, but there's no response. Um, I found that with my flute playing, I originally took it up again. I, I learned flute when I was 11 or 10 and quit when I was 14. Um, 
tried again when I was in my 40s, quit again, tried again when I was in my 50s, quit again and tried again now with the third teacher. And I went and saw a therapist for it because I was still quitting the flute and getting a, getting a blank wall. And um, I saw a therapist through my healthcare system and she was helping me to provide support for myself and, and be good to myself and that was great. But it only got me a certain, a certain progress. It didn't take me further. So I went to find another therapist to help me to go in and I needed that help because for me that sign of having that freedom to play music and to sing is something that I want I want that exile to come out. Now what are some other signs that we need help? Someone who is feeling depressed, hopeless, who has intrusive thoughts. Intrusive thoughts are not that you would act on them but it's from anxiety and an intrusive thought is, for example, if somebody is driving and they suddenly, their mind flashes a car accident. Or women who have postpartum depression, um, one of the symptoms of postpartum depression is, God forbid, that, that, that the baby is injured. Um, and, and it is very, very painful to have those intrusive thoughts, especially in the postpartum when a baby is involved. Um, if there's chronic irritability, if you just can't can't enjoy anything, if, if there's like everything bothers you, um, or if there's like rage or anger that doesn't go away, um, with kids uh, it can come out as as a lot of anger and tantruming, and just keeps going and going, and no matter what an adult does, it just doesn't go away. Um, or a lack of ability to feel pleasure, which is one of the symptoms of depression. Those are the situations where you need help. If God forbid there's, um, there's violence in the home, that's when you need to get help. That is not something, not something that needs to be done independently, that that would need to be help, need outside help and resources. And that's basically what I had to say. I'm wondering